I'd like to entitle this talk, Comunicatio Imperfecta, the Dominican Order and Thomism in the Service of the Church's Intellectual Life and Universal Mission. And I'd like to begin it with a motto, which will sound like a platitude unless you know where it's taken from. It's from Hubert Yedin's uh, essay, Vaticanum, uh, Vatican II and the Tridentine Council, Tradition and Progress in the History of the Church, arguing in that essay that you need to read these two councils together. You can and you need to read them together. And the quote is, tradition taken in a broad sense and progress, both in quotation marks, are not opposites, but necessary components of the life and vital function of the church. I'd like to begin by thanking Father Thomas Joseph White, the Thomistic Institute, the Faculty of the Immaculate Conception, the Priory of the DHS, and the Province of St. Joseph for the invitation to speak this evening. Also the many uh, confratres whom I've uh, been able to listen to and speak to in these days. It is customary to call such an invitation an honor and a joy. It is certainly an honor to speak before so many who know so much about this topic, which is at the heart of much of what they are and do, but the joy is qualified by that same awareness of my expert audience. It is hard not to think of this task as simply bringing owls to Athens and coals to Newcastle, or at best pouring new oil into old fires. <laughs> that Father Thomas Joseph has offered me such a large, empty canvas on which to paint my picture of Thomistic renewal does little, little to quiet my anxiety. The Dominican Order, Thomism, the Church, or intellectual life, and universal mission all focused anew on our particular place in ecclesial and secular history. Anything else, Thomas Joseph? <laughs> I will refer to a few conference papers, but I will try to avoid direct mention of the published works of those here present, simply because more of you would need to be referred to than my time allows, given the three main questions assigned to me. What is the church sent to be and do for humankind? What is the Dominican order sent to be and do for the church? And what is Thomism still called to be and do with and for the order today? Given all that complexity, let me begin with something simple, not quo ad nos, but in se, the doctrine of God, one and triune, or better, an idea that Thomas Aquinas referred to and referenced without making it as had William of Auxerre, the very center of his thought, the notion of the Trinity as communicatio perfecta. The two times in his commentary on the first book of the sentences where the young Bacalarius Thomas first makes explicit use of this figure, he explicates the contrast to us. There could be no complete sharing by God of his goodness. The otherwise absolute good could never be fully and absolutely good never fully diffusivum sui, were this goodness shared only with creatures who can take part in the divine goodness in at best fragmentary ways. The good cannot be perfectly shared with creatures, sed non perfecte communicat creature, or sed in creaturis non sume se communicat. Thomas thus echoes William on the plausibility of the Trinity accentuating with him the consequent freedom of creation that follows from this insight into the diffusive character of goodness. The communication of the good to creatures, while not perfect, is also not necessary, but free. God had relationality and perfect sharing, the communicatio boni, in himself. The diffusion of goodness into its imperfect communication with creatures was a free choice and one of the best reasons for us not to despair of that creation. Thomas uh, stresses that God's desire to share his goodness also leaves him with and leads him to the option of sharing his life with creatures, in particular with created persons who can receive and respond to it in ways that, if imperfect, are graced, moving them beyond some of their creaturely limitations and making a blessing of still others of the limitations that remain. This is the key and for Thomas characteristic insight into caritas as friendship that will lead him to his most extensive theological reflection on the concept communicatio, positioned less in the theology of the imminent trinity and more in the theology of how the trinity 
shares its beatitude even with less receptive persons. It belongs to the original insights of the young Thomas into the potential significance of a theological reception of Aristotle, sometimes, as here, an Aristotle read against the grain, that charity between God and humans could, patse Aristotle, be understood as friendship based on shared goods, a communicatio boni of unique character. It is this sapiential view of divine human friendship that will lead Thomas to treat the theme of communication most extensively. It is also this original and lasting insight of Thomas into charity as friendship based on free, if imperfect, communicatio that can also generate answers to the three questions posed to me, the answers to which all of which have to do with the concept of communication. First then, the Church's universal mission, intellectual life, and the post-conciliar place of Thomistic studies. This first and longest point I will break down into three subsections, the first of which is the hermeneutic of the Council. Some of this we've already heard, but perhaps uh, at this point we could do a bit of review. The historical situation for understanding our three questions can be located on the map of possibilities in good part by attention to the coordinate, the Second Vatican Council. The twin difficulties in accessing the Council or assessing its reception locate the difficulties for the renewal of Thomism as well, namely the sense of been there, done that, and the understandable desire to avoid or walk away from the ideological wars associated with the Council its prehistory and its reception. Both sorts of difficulties are qualified, however, and uh, softened, if you like, by the cogency of a relatively new hermeneutic of reform. This reading of the Council and post-conciliar developments, suggested by Benedict XVI in the first year of his pontificate, 2005, and articulated and nuanced since then by many authors, recently by Cardinal Kurt Koch, as an alternative to reading the Council through a hermeneutics of rupture or through a hermeneutics of mere continuity. The third possibility, a hermeneutics of reform, can profit much from the historical research of the last 15 years into the genesis of conciliar documents and the identification of the de facto inclusion in all 16 documents of somewhat opposed moments of innovation and reaffirmation. The hermeneutics of reform adds to the identification of the historical differences at the Council the normative value of acknowledging both movements in non-contradictory complementarity in the synthesis of mere contraries. Uh, for example, strengthening the episcopacy, not through the weaknesses, but through the strengths of papal and priestly service, enlivening the laity by an extension, but also by the renewal of religious and priestly life embracing inner Christian ecumenism and the value of non-Christian religions by a renewed affirmation of Roman Catholic identity, the appreciative solidarity with the Gaudium et Spes of today's world by greater critical attention to contemporary Luctus et Angor, knowing that the Church is nearer to the world when she is sensitive to its weaknesses, contributing to the humanity-wide task of education by also developing Catholic schools and universities, or enhancing the actual participation of the laity in the liturgy by a greater awareness of Christ, not the community, as the principal subject of Eucharistic intercession. Um, the normative synthesis of majority and minority passages from the agreed upon Vatican documents uh, is at the center of the hermeneutics of reform, although not just to say there was a factical diversity, but to say that the challenge today is to think out uh, a normative synthesis of those different positions. Fifty years after the Council itself, the ongoing need for a more adequate reception and development of the Council confirms the basic lessons of hermeneutical philosophy on the necessity and the difficulties of collective, recollective narrative on the use and misuse both of memory and of the forgetting necessary for it. For, and I dedicate this quote to our uh, confrater, Dominic Holtz, remembering is possible only on the basis of forgetting. Yes, Dominic, that is from Martin Heidegger. And uh, uh, Gadamer, some not quite, well, a little more than 30 years later, would elucidate it. 
quote, in ways that are largely overlooked, forgetting belongs to the relation between retaining and remembering. Forgetting means not merely loss and privation, but as Friedrich Nietzsche stressed, it is a necessary condition for the life of our mind. It is only by forgetting that our mind receives the possibility of a thoroughgoing renewal, the ability to see things anew with a fresh look, so that what was old and familiar now blends with what is newly seen in a, into a multidimensional unity." End of quote. In the context of our conference on renewal, the question will be, what about Thomas was forgotten 50 years ago, and what did that forgetting help us to remember in the meanwhile? Because a certain kind of forgetting is necessary for there to be a genuine recollection, and because forgetting, therefore, like remembering, needs direction and self-examination, it is not surprising that time had to pass before the all too real, often scarring conflicts at the Council and in the years following could be forgotten enough to allow the scribes who had become disciples to imitate the head of the household who brings from his storeroom both the new and the old. End of quote from Matthew 13. Locating the question of the Church's universal mission within a hermeneutic of uh, conciliar reform is made easier by the, church's, the Council's own focus on the Church ad intra et ad extra. In, in both directions, the immediate conflictual reality of the Council needed to become historical before the implicit synthetic possibilities of the Church's mission could unfold, with a renewal ad intra, both the prerequisite and the fruit of a new engagement ad extra. The reading of the Council and the renewal of Thomism both require for the desired synthesis of Nova et Vetera, the twin arts of intentional forgetting and recollection. The um, second subsection then on Thomas and the Council. The importance of the conciliar context for the study of St. Thomas is not only and not even principally to be sought in recto in the roughly 20 express references to Thomas Aquinas to be found there. That holds true even for the most overt controversies, we've heard about oh, at least one of them, such as the decree Optatum Totius 16, with its reference into Alia to the study of St. Thomas as a guide and aid to the kind of speculation that can illumine and interconnect as completely as possible the mysteries of salvation. Likewise, for the declaration Gravissimo Meducationis, number 10, where universities, in particular Catholic universities and faculties, are encouraged to pursue questions, quote, questions that are new and current, according to the example of the doctors of the church and especially St. Thomas Aquinas, end of quote. And in pursuit, well, again a quote, a, a deeper realization of the harmony of faith and science, end quote. The harmonizing or compromised character of the explicit conciliar references to Thomas become clearer when one considers, notably in the case of priestly training, the skeptical reception at the Council of the submissions shortly before the Council by the Congregation for Seminaries and Universities and, and as uh, Father Thomas Joseph White discussed on Monday, by the Lateran University in the person of Cornelio Fabro, calling for the return of St. Thomas and his leadership in the course of studies with the title Dux Studiorum which got translated, unfortunately, into German as Führer der Studien. <laughs> <laughs> the, mo the moment of discontinuity is to be found in the Council's rejection of these suggestions and concomitantly in the forgetting or relativizing of Thomas as Dr. Communis, uh, at least in the common sense or a very widespread sense of the term, that is, in the search for far wider resources for resourcement and aggiornamento. While this partial but perceptible forgetting of the doctor communis can be documented in the quantitative reduction of the presence of Thomism in the post-conciliar theological education and discourse, the remembering of Thomas as a quite uncommon pioneer of theological and philosophical renewal has been enhanced. The roughly 1,000 titles per annum which the bibliography of the Corpus Thomisticum records for Thomistic studies without any claim to being exhaustive is less impressive than the success in the last 50 years of attempts to locate Thomas in the context of, including his differences from, many of his and our contemporaries. The previous norms on Thomistic studies had led many Thomistic ventriloquists 
into the temptation to read the appealing ideas of a Fichte or a Hegel right into Thomas himself, rather than placing him in the give and take of open discourse with these later thinkers. Developments within Thomas's own thought, once the topic of Thomistic research in the Middle Ages and in early modernity, documenting, for example, where Thomas spoke better in the Summa than in the sentences, this kind of method has been retrieved and enhanced in the last 50 years. The scope of uh, the um, genera in which Tom, in Thomas's own theological and philosophical works, including homiletic and biblical work, has won new attention. Appreciation has grown for the particular theological programmatic of Thomas, including, but not reduced to, the theological impetus behind the properly philosophical work, not just of his early, but tellingly of precisely of his later years. We've heard from Bishop Moreau of that importance. Those who say Thomas should only be considered uh, in his theological works, with the pendulum swings in the other way, should be reminded that he began to work uh, almost fevered in his later years on philosophy as philosophy. And one would have to look, um, one would have to ask why he would do that and perhaps exhausted himself in the process. The one stylish dismissal of later Thomists in contrast, in contrast to Thomas himself, Thomas good, Thomas bad, that shows signs of yielding to a, a more historical, more Newman-like sense of the necessity, of course, also the fragility of genuine organic development, confirming for the growth of Thomism the applicability of Newman's seven notes of genuine development and the navigation between the scylla of mere repetition and the charybdis of the lost grasp on seminal truths. Thus, the significance for Thomistic studies of the controversial reception of Thomas's legacy in its epochal development from the Defensiones and Commentatores to the post tridentine Disputationes, the Baroque scholasticism of Suarez, and the various neo-Thomisms of the last century. The trend to a more historical and particular reading of the uncommon Thomas and his reception the shift in focus from the Dr. Comunis to Frater Thomas and his new readers continues to prepare and enable a systematic appropriation which can often surprise and enrich us, no longer representing just the moment of continuity, but offering also unfamiliar resources for the entire post-conciliar synthetic project of a hermeneutics of reform and its refiguring the unity in tension of the conciliar legacy. Where 50 years ago the Dr. Comunis, at least in one common understanding of that term, was forgotten, Frater Thomas and his uncommon tradition has increasingly been remembered as a concrete reality of the past and as a distinct possibility of the present and future. He calls us towards a new sense of what Comunis might mean, a new central paradigm. Final section, uh, subsection here uh, as an example. In reference to the Church's universal mission, the dogmatic constitution on Revelation provides us with a good test example. Although Joseph Rothinger's commentary on Dei Verbum in the Lexicon for Theologie und Kirche, distinguishing the still unsynthesized conflicting positions of the minority and the majority within the agreed text of Dei Verbum, and referring to the uneven character in the final text with, as he said, logical gaps that are covered over only with difficulty, end quote, Still harsher was the verdict of the Thomas expert Otto Hermann Pesch, quote, the Constitution is arguably the most uneven text of the Council, including, here he cites Rothinger, logical gaps that are covered over only with difficulty, or better said, as he continues, contradictions, a paradigm of that kind of compromise which is contradictory pluralism, end quote. Even if Pesch goes too far here, the tension in each chapter of the text is, in any case, obvious between a salvific historical sense of the self-revelation of God and references by the written words of scripture and tradition to the paths and precepts best serving humanity. A hermeneutic of reform would seek to disprove the charge of self-contradiction and find in an argued synthesis affirming, find meaning in an argued synthesis affirming the foundational and teleological reality of God's self-communication and the need for a verbal expression of, a, of a God and what he asks 
of us and promises his creation and redemption. Such a synthesis, self-communication and verbal expression, could profit from the first two twinned articles of the Secunda Secunde, pointing first to the simple and ineffable first truth beyond all formulae as the primary object of faith, and then, what's often forgotten, adding immediately that we would be further away from this simple truth if we lacked any ability to speak about it with the complexities and limitations required by our admittedly imperfect forms of knowledge, language, and community. The reference in De Verbum II to divine love, together with the friendship and fellowship in Christ which it makes possible by the Spirit, is certainly not in conflict with majority intentions. Although the rejection of the schema de fontibus, a rejection argued effectively by a very young Joseph Ratzinger, included the critique and its reliance on Gergur Lagrange's De Revelatione. Surprisingly then, Eberhard Schokenhof has recently pointed out the affinity between De Verbum's notion of God's self-communication and St. Thomas's programmatic interpretation of charity as friendship based on a grace communicatio or prevenient sharing in God's life. I quote from Schokenhof, the expression communicatio understood in its dynamically transitive aspect could best be translated into a concept familiar to today's theological language as the self-revelation of God. Thomas's accomplishment as a thinker is to be found here. Against the background of the biblical view of God, Thomas interpreted the concept of communicatio, which stands for the Greek word koinonia, in such a way that it can help us to conceive a kind of similarity, a lack of which had led Aristotle to exclude the possibility of friendship between gods and human beings, end of quote. The parallel is of interest not so much as an anticipation of the contemporary theology of divine self-communication, it's also good, but its ability, even more important, is its ability to suggest to us a synth synth uh, synthesis needed for a plausible hermeneutic of reform. As the retrieval of communicatio, the communicatio of caritas by authors such as Joseph Bobich and Guy Mancini have shown, friendship according to this rather free but programmatic appropriation of Aristotle's ethics is based on and articulated by the goods shared, uh, here not as a cause but as a result of God's prevenient love and grace. It's not the kind of friendship where you have something in common and, and therefore uh, love the other, but it's because of the love of God that we are able to have this kind of good with him in common, which is the, this uh, um, look towards the beatitude. The likeness that follows requires the mutuality of acknowledgement, proper to persons. That's what we can gain from an exact uh, analysis of Thomas's uh, appropriation, changing appropriation of Aristotle. Um, so the likeness that follows requires mutuality of acknowledgement, because that is what is proper to persons. Communicatio of shared love cannot be fulfilled in mute or blind feeling, Patze Schleiermacher and his delayed Catholic reception. One might say that the Christians of tomorrow must not only be mystics, they must be able to confess and express their faith or they will not be Christians at all. Uh, I recall what Bernhard Blankenhorn told us just a few hours ago about the cataphatic uh, side of Thomas Aquinas' uh, interpretation of Dionysius. So Christians of tomorrow must not only be mystics, but must be able to confess and express their faith, or they will not be Christians at all. Far from a return to informational notions of revelation, such a cry for language, the search for the proper word, is a mark of the interpersonal nature of God's self-revelatory love. I remind us of what we heard from uh, Olivier, uh, Olivier Thomas um, Bernard about uh, communities of language and also what we heard from Father Bonino about the structure of the Trinity as Dietzen's verbum and amor. Personal revelation includes the understanding and response of the receiver, the person spoken to. Revelation is only given fully when it is received and answered. The responsoriality which God intends is, as Thomas tells us, rooted in the communication of divine beatitude that expresses itself in faith. Emmanuel Perrier had also referred to that. The Church's universal mission as a sacrament of divine revelation 
is to aid human beings of every age in this quest for the responsorial achievement of God's self-revelation of his love for humankind. With that, I come to the second and shorter point, which I'm going to make even shorter by allowing myself to <clears throat> cite two long quotations, which will make the paper shorter because I won't have to add that much to them. Although the opening words from the decree on the adaptation and renewal of religious life, perfecte caritatis, recall and cite St. Thomas's theology of a life consecrated by vows to God, the tension characteristic of the council appears in the um, in, in the dialectical, an intentionally dialectical title, renovatio accomodata, a dialectical phrase, a retrieval of beginnings into the now. The constitution, Lumen Gentium, had already indicated the hopes of the council in this regard. The extension of spiritual and apostolic ideals previously associated with religious should be extended beyond the classical orders. Lumen Gentium's placing of the chapter on the laity before its chapters on the universal call to holiness and before the chapter on religious was a reflection of this hope to extend, not evacuate, the richness of consecrated life and the numbers of those who would embrace it. Renovatio accommodata also indicates the method for renewal, looking back to the founder in order to refigure uh, future paths forward. In the case of the Order of Preachers, the task leads back two generations behind St. Thomas to St. Dominic. An analysis of the unusually frequent testimonies to the prayers of St. Dominic would reveal the centrality of mercy regarding the pain of, of not being able to believe or to believe aright in the gospel. Seems like people were always spying on St. Dominic's prayers, but uh, all the better for us. Dominic's prayers are, with few exceptions, either directly for those so suffering or for the means to aid, um, to aid such persons. A moment, excuse me. To aid them by a preaching prepared by forms of contemplative study rooted on a kind of communicatio in a life of voluntary poverty, share the life of those to whom one was preaching. In study as Misericordia Veritatis, the prologue to the document on intellectual life drafted in this province at the elective chapter in Providence in 2001, the link identified is identified between Dominic's sense of mercy and his concern for academic studies. A site that's a little bit longer, but I think it, it tells us what the order is about. Quote, thanks to St. Dominic's innovative spirit, study ordered to the salvation of souls was involved intimately in the purpose and regular life of the order. St. Dominic himself led the brethren to places of learning in the largest cities so that they might prepare for their mission. Our study must aim principally, ardently, and with greatest care at what can be useful for the souls of our neighbors. From then on, study would be linked essentially to the apostolic mission of the order and to preaching the word of God interrupt the quote for a moment, the preaching and the study necessary to prepare for it had for Dominic paracletic character, that is to say aiding by words the paraclete's internal work of communication which is the church's universal mission. This work of spiritual advocation is enunciated in the text just cited and it continues as follows. This questioning of human value is um, a, an intrinsic part of today's most pressing Questiones disputate. The reference was actually to Augustine's questioning of what it means to be human. The self doubt about human dignity covers the three ancient questions which, since Kant, have been said to const constitute together the encompassing question what is the human being? These three questions what can I know? What should I do? What may I hope for? raising interrelated doubts about the capacity of humans for truth, for freedom, and for eternal life call for the intellectual compassion acquired in good part by the labor of study. The assiduous study of today's questiones disputate should lead us to understand the pressures to doubt without submitting to the despair about human dignity. Crediti etiam cum locutus sum ego humiliatus sum nimis ego dixi intrepidatione mea omnis homo mendax. Feeling the trepidation of our times, especially about our capacity for truth, omnis homo mendax, and seeing the manifold humiliation of human life as our own 
and yet bringing to the world the confidence of the gospel, together with its concomitant demand for justice and peace, Dominican study is to be marked by both a habit of humility and a confidence in the paracletic mission of the church, defending the dignity proclaimed in creation and redemption, and helping to make faith believable in our day. In this way, Dominican study can and must serve the misericordia veritatis, end quote. You see here a kind of comunicatio that is not just looking so much at shared goods, but at shared burdens. And it's the, the identification with these burdens, especially intellectual burdens, the doubt that there is truth, the doubt that there is any sort of moral action that's not all just, uh, perhaps all just uh, will to power, and that there is hope uh, beyond death and beyond the limitations of humanity. Those are the challenges that come with us, and when we at least know of their burden, then we form a new kind of community, a new sort of comunicatio, imperfecta, but still one that's very graced and a basis for how the order can live out that universal mission of the church. St. Thomas conceived the communicatio which founds friendship as a sharing of a common good. In, this, in the case of charity, that good, as was said, is the perspective of shared beatitude. But in his reflections on mercy, Thomas notes a further kind of communicatio. And I, this is the second long quote, but then I promise you I'll get on to part three, last part. From, Thomas says, from the very fact that a person takes pity on anyone, it follows that another's distress grieves him. And since sorrow or grief is about one's own ills, one grieves or sorrows for another's distress insofar as one looks upon another's distress as one's own. Now this happens in two ways. First, through the union of the affections, which is the effect of love. For since he who loves another looks upon his friend as another's self, he counts his friend's hurt as his own, so that he grieves for his friend's hurt as though he were hurt himself. Secondly, it happens through real union. For instance, when another's evil comes near to us, so as to pass from them to us. Hence the philosopher says, men pity such as are akin to them and belike, because it makes them realize that the same may happen to themselves. This also explains why the old and wise number of us here who are at least half of that, uh, explains why the old and wise who consider that they may fall upon evil times, also um, feeble and fearsome persons are more inclined to pity, whereas those who deem themselves happy and so far powerful as to think themselves in no danger of suffering any hurt are not so inclined to pity, end of quote. Dominic's initial advocational task of preaching as a defense of human hope from the twin dangers in church and society of collective presumption and collective despair, twin dangers located by Paul Murray in the prayers of Thomas, this paracletic task must be accommodated or brought into today, communicated and shared with others without losing the order's own sense of urgent calling. It remains to be asked in a third section what it is about the thought of St. Thomas that makes it conducive to misericordia veritatis, to the paracletic task of intellectual compassion that led St. Dominic to found the order of preachers. One f little comment before we do that, that's, that will be part three, and that is something again that came up both with uh, Father Sponino and Father, uh, and, and, uh, Father Paolo, namely that the question of theodicy. Uh, it was theodicy posed in terms of the omnipotence of God, in terms of the providence of God. We can look at the first conference that the Thomistic Institute here had with the Reformed theologians at, uh, at uh, Princeton on the impassibility of God. It, those used to be attributes of God which were defended classically for the sake of God. Then came a time, Father Benino mentioned Moltmann, when in the 20th century one thought one could deny something like omnipotence and providence and impassibility for the sake of humanity. And if I see the discussion in theodicy correctly in the last 30 years, there's a tendency to defend omnipotence, providence, and impassibility for the sake of humanity. So there is a kind of uh, way in which you can see the connection between advocacy or defending the hope of human beings and the, the contemplation of God, which also uh, yesterday we, we heard of from uh, Father Emery. 
Thomas's aside, and this is now the, t the final section, the tasks of Thomistic studies. Thomas is aside that mercy is impossible for those who think they have no faults and for those who have no hope, reflects two key advocational dimensions of his own theological and philosophical program, matching Thomas's struggles with Neo-Augustinianism and radical Aristotelianism. The earliest critiques of Thomas provide us one measure of what contemporaries of Thomas saw as his innovations, saw as what was remarkable about him. William de Lamar's Correctorium Fratris Tome, arguably the first articulation of Thomism, I don't want to necessarily say he invented Thomism, but in a certain sense, I think that would be appropriate. Anyway, arguably the first articulation of Thomism as a broad representation of Thomas's chief themes, he charges Thomas with ignoring the censures of 1241 and, uh, and following, also 1270 and 1277, to continue Dominican support for Dionysius, the pseudo Areopagite, and his restriction of the possibilities of graced event by the pre-givens of created structures. We heard Bernhard Blankenhorn today on that, and recall that, that Bonaventure is the first one to cite for us the axiom gratia presupponent naturum. He did it critically, he did it against the Dominicans, and he did it in the context of the celestial hierarchies of Dionysius. William uh, of uh, uh, de Lamar sees the Parisian censures of 1270 and 77 as concretizing this critique of Thomas's theological philosophical anthropology the secondary and necessarily generalizing character of knowledge vis-a-vis -vis sensation, the secondary character of choice vis-a-vis -vis passions and the will of the good in general, the seeming challenges to eternal hopes arising from the newly stressed unity of body and soul are repeated targets of William's critique, matching well the censure by Robert Kilwardby in the previous year of the um, theological implications of the unicity of the substantial form in human beings. The criticism by John Peckham and Bonaventure of Thomas's assertion of an antinomy of weak reason in the question of the eternity or beginning of the world is a further sign of the novelty attached in his own day to Thomas's attempt to integrate into a theological synthesis the new limits of even graced human life, even of Christ's life and passion. Those attempts, however, mark Thomas's solidarity with those who were tempted to despair of the traditional Christian hope. These attempts were paralleled by Thomas's critique of the philosophical arguments trying to draw even this expression of Christian hope into doubt. The reassertion of personal human intelligence and freedom and the possibility of cogent God talk, albeit within deniable, undeniable limits, together with a new plausibility of resurrection flowing from new insights into the corporeality of human existence, show Thomas's sympathy with those who struggled against too brutish and non-transcendent a picture of human animality. It was Thomas's share in the tears and fears of radical Aristotelianism that allowed him to share in unconventional ways in the joys and hopes of Neo-Augustinians. Perhaps that is why the philosophical faculty of Paris asked the Dominicans that when Thomas died if they could have his uh, remains. Dominicans didn't possess those remains and uh, couldn't really help, but the fact that they wanted them already shows you how Thomas's involvement here did touch many people. Thomas uh, acknowledged the weakness of human nature while seeing in those weaknesses an occasion for the new friendship with God seeing the community and communication which provide otherwise impossible gifts to the mingle of and mensch. Asserting the need and the capacity for grace, affirming the characterological and Christological perfections that make beatitude more than a distant dream, Thomas provided a paradigm of paracletic thought that would continue to fascinate centuries to come. Perhaps less keen on harmony than is often suggested, one thinks already in his early years of his vocational choice against family and emperor, his uh, also somewhat cheek in the choice of his topic for his inception, his option for the Dominican reading of Dionysius and much more. So despite his freedom from an excessive trendy irenicism, Thomas provided an enduring basis for the advocacy of a hope that can withstand understandable doubts. Because human weakness is a prerequisite of this community of grace, it would be a pyrrhic victory for us and a performative self-contradiction 
to exclude in principle from Thomistic studies the kind of critique of that, uh, that acknowledges the grandeur et misere in, pa in passages such as the Summa Theologiae um, uh, Secunda Secunde 10.8 on the forbearance and compulsion uh, toward non and no longer believers and with forbearance for heathens and Jews but with uh, compulsion for heretics and apostates. I would like to conclude with reference to other kinds of communities, imperfect communities but important communities in which a form of grace, if necessarily imperfect communicatio, is needed for Thomistic studies. Given the complex role of the order of preachers in the church's service of the word, it is neither possible nor desirable that every preacher be an accomplished and convinced Thomist. What is important is that the study of Thomas be encouraged and enabled in the order as a key part of its legacy and office, and that even brothers devoting their lives to other theological and academic projects or to other aspects of the order's paracletic mission have a thorough acquaintance with Thomas's thought and heritage. At times, there is an academic cross-fertilization. Uh, Paul uh, Sunave or, and Pierre Benoit uh, gave um, uh, testimony to this in the realm of the justification of historical exegesis. There was an engagement of early modern and contemporary science by uh, William Wallace in the River Forest, River Forest School, as we have heard. Victor White or Antonio Moreno on the consideration of psychoanalytic and depth psychological uh, theory and practice, and other examples could be brought as well. But whether or not such interdisciplinary uh, um, activity occurs, without a common familiarity with Thomas, much would be lost for the communicatio, for the community and commonality of the Dominican family, and thus for its life and mission. The cultivation of this fraternal community of remembrance and forgetting will require more intentionality, more resources, and more institutional creativity and international cooperation than what has become the norm over the last 50 years. In this context, once again, my thanks and my admiration for the founding in this province of the Thomistic Institute. Given the complex character of this topic, it is not surprising that uh, there is a plurality of methodological approaches in the study of St. Thomas. Recent attempts to map the topology of Thomistic methods have distinguished Leonine, existential, transcendental, analytic, ressourcement, and neo-Thomistic methods. Text editions, the analysis of Thomas's own development as evidenced in his texts and genres, Thomas's sources, contemporaries, followers, and critics, his potential relevance in debates not yet begun in his day or even developed in ours, the discourse of Thomism with natural science, political theory, or international law and human rights with religions and atheisms with variant Catholic and Christian traditions, all these methodologies and conversations are in themselves all legitimate undertakings, the complexity of which has led to a certain understandable division of labor within the study of St. Thomas and his legacy. And with this division of labor, again, a kind of uh, communicatio imperfecta. The greater the methodological diversity, the more urgent becomes the sapiential task of ordering these methodologies to one another, neglecting uh, for the synthetic view or uh, synoptic view, neither the historical past nor the future of society and environment. And for that sapiential task, no one individual suffices, a community is needed. The notions above of the desired expanse of revelation of the uncommon doctor, of the unity and tension of a hermeneutic of reform, of the search for new voices in ressourcement en journamento, and of many fruitful dialogues between Thomas and X are all indications of the wider communities with which Thomism will seek conversation and where it will show many of its best qualities. Thomism languages most when controversies are rare. I owe that, I shouldn't say, I want, it's breaking my own rule, but that comes from Father Cesario. The Thomism languages where, where most when controversies are rare. Richard Scheffler has shown that theological conceptions of sapientia differ from one another by the space they allow or deny to scientia, intellectus, and prudentia. The Thomistic notion of sapientia has from the beginning looked forward to communication between sciences that are not deduced from one another as much as they're ordered to one another. 
to recall a notion put forward by Francisco Muniz in a special printing of the Thomist, theology itself, more so historical and systematic branches of theology, and finally, Thomistically oriented methodolo methodologies in history and systematics can be conceived as parts of potential wholes, wholes made up of heterogeneous parts that in need of one another, but varying and vying with one another in what they can contribute to that whole in which they share. Thomism cannot live without this sense of communication with what is outside it. In a later edition of his chief work on philosophical anthropology, Arnold Galen once acknowledged a, a criticism or a review by Joseph Pieper, referring to Galen's central theme of the compen compensat con compensatory strengths of community stemming from the initial deficient instinctual system of the individual as Mingelwesen, as an essence of deficiency. Pieper pointed out to Galen, who concurred and recorded his agreement, that these insights are close to those presented by Thomas Aquinas in the Prima Pars and famously at the beginning of De Regno with references back to Avicenna and Aristotle. What the human lacks in refined instincts and physical prowess is more than made up for by a diachronic and synchronic community made possible by language. Such strengths of a linguistic human community with collective memory are similar to those sought in graced community with God. Out of this initial weakness grows a new and greater community with God than we would have had otherwise by nature. With charity-driven attention to Nova et Vetera, the renewal of Thomism can well serve these emergent communities and worlds of shared interest. Thank you. With Richard, I want to echo his gratitude to our brother Thomas Joseph for all that he has done to organize this, and also to the Brothers of St. Joseph Province. This has been a wonderful experience for me. I think it's been a wonderful experience for all of us who have been present, and I certainly intend to tell the Master of the Order how good this has been, and I know he will be grateful as well to all of the brothers here who have organized this. So thank you very much, brothers. But I also want to extend my thanks to our brother Richard Shank for a very wonderful paper that he's offered to us, one that is provocative, interesting, and I think also sets some directions for us. And I'd like to talk about a few of these things. I've been told I can, I've been given a few more minutes, so I'm going to take them. <laughs> Certainly, I'm not going to be able to talk about all that Richard has uh, included in his paper. But certainly there were several points that really do call for further consideration, I hope by him. One of them would be this question of how we should be interpreting the Second Vatican Council, not simply as it sometimes has been done through a, a hermeneutic of continuity or a hermeneutic of discontinuity, but a hermeneutic of reform. I think that is a very uh, important thing for us to consider. And especially what was intriguing, and he did not have an opportunity to go into it as much as I wish he'd been able, is his uh, discussion of the relationship between remembering and forgetting and the way that we are able to reappropriate when this kind of dynamic of remembering and forgetting actually is allowed to function. I think that is very rich in many ways, especially as we reflect back on the Council, but even on our own Thomistic tradition in the 20th century, the remembering, the forgetting, and the reappropriating. I think these are both two very important ideas. But I'd like to talk tonight for a few minutes about communication, because Richard, near the end of his paper, encourages all of us to remain firm in our commitment to our Thomistic legacy. He argues that all of us should be well trained, well formed in it. Now I have no expectation that most of the brothers in the order will have the kind of expertise and the kind of facility that some of you have in this room. But I think it is absolutely correct to say 
that, that this Thomistic legacy is very much a part of our Dominican intellectual tradition. And it belongs to all of us as a kind of intellectual lingua franca. And as an intellectual lingua franca, it's something that we should have a facility with and be able to use wherever we are, whoever we are in the order. And this lingua franca, this intellectual lingua franca, which is our Dominican tradition, does in fact enable us to come to a deeper understanding of the divine communication within God himself, the divine communication between God and creatures, but it also allows us to understand the kind of communication of the gospel that takes place between human beings. And that's what I would like to speak for a few minutes about. What our Thomistic heritage, what our Dominican intellectual tradition offers in the preaching mission of the order. And brothers, again, I am painfully aware that when I speak about what the Dominican intellectual tradition offers to the preaching of mission of the order, that I am an American. I have been living in Santa Sabina for a year and a half, and every day it becomes clear to me I am an American. And the way that I think and the way that Western Europeans think are not necessarily the same way that Asians speak or think or South Americans or Africans. So my remarks when I say what the Dominican intellectual tradition has to offer, and especially our Thomistic tradition, please be thinking here in terms of North America and Western Europe. I'm not ready to say that everywhere in the world that it would have the same resonance. But I would say three things that we offer at the present time and our Dominican intellectual tradition offers. First is, despite our awareness of sin and the obvious presence of evil in our world, Dominicans fundamentally believe in the goodness of the world and its graced character. Like all Christians, we acknowledge God as our creator who makes all things from nothing simply out of his goodness, out of his love, freely and without any compulsion or force. But perhaps our Thomistic tradition, more than others, emphasizes that in creating, God chooses to share his goodness with those whom he has created. He creates not for his own benefit, but for ours. And the world in all of its multiplicity and diversity reflects God's extraordinary goodness. The array of species and the multitude of individual things that make up our world, each in its way, mirrors God's beauty, his goodness, his power, his wisdom. In some way, every single thing in our world gives us access, veiled and imperfect as it may be, to God himself. To find God, we do not have to begin our search in the church. And I think, especially in Western Europe and in the United States, that is something that can be very helpful and useful in the proclamation of the gospel today. This Dominican attitude toward the world, one that is fundamentally optimistic and hopeful, can also run counter to a religious culture that sometimes appears reticent, suspicious, and even frightened of the world. Again, I do not want to suggest that Dominicans should be naive or that we should close our eyes to the injustice or violence around us. St. Thomas teaches us to begin by looking always at what is real. So never should we turn away our eyes. Yet Dominicans brothers always live with hope. And we have reason to hope because we see in all things the potential for good because all things have been made by God and mirror 
his goodness. Related, and this would be my second point, related to this notion of goodness is the Dominican understanding of the human person. Again, grounded in the teaching and experience of St. Dominic himself, his experience with the Cathars. Unlike other Christians and even other Catholics, Dominicans do not separate and compartmentalize the human person. We don't do that. Rather, we see the profound unity in every man and in every woman. Where too often Christianity is caricatured as a religion at war with the body or dismissive of the body, Dominicans identify human beings with their bodily existence. And we emphasize this dimension of the human person. We don't ignore it. We don't dismiss it. We are not embarrassed by it. We give more than grudging respect to the physical, emotional, and social character that is so much a part of our physicality. These two, Thomas Aquinas tells us, lead us to God. Yet we also acknowledge that we are more than our bodies. Endowed with intelligence, we have the ability not simply to know, but also to understand. Not simply to desire, but to choose, and to choose freely. This unified view of the human person offers something very positive and powerful to the present world, where so many people either marginalize, where so many people either materialize everything about the human person or spiritualize everything about the human person. We recognize the profound unity of the person a unity that so many people in our world, and again, I'm speaking of the West, where so many people are truly longing for a deeper integration in their lives and even in their very persons. This is something we also have to offer. From this vision of the human being in which both understanding and freedom are constitutive elements of human life, Dominicans have developed their understanding of truth. Where so many others in our world doubt the knowability of truth, either by their skepticism or by their fideism, Dominicans believe that we are capax veritatis. We are capax veritatis because we are capax dei. Yet such a grasp of truth is not easily or passively acquired by simply reading a book or citing the auctoritates, whoever and whatever these may be. These provide only an acquaintance with the truth, not our friendship with the truth. Rather, our pursuit of truth, brothers, and I'm reluctant to say our attainment of the truth, because this is a lifelong project. This pursuit of the truth requires a constant and never-ending engagement with others, especially with those who do not think like us. And again, Richard raises this earlier in his in his talk, and apparently our brother Romanus, this is where <laughs> he has said the same. As we all learned, brothers, as young students, the legacy of Abelard's sick at non and the development of the dialectic allowed the human intellect to move beyond apparent contradictions to a deeper and fuller grasp of the truth. Such an encounter could not happen without an engagement with the other, especially with that other whose thoughts 
and whose perspectives differ at times quite radically from our own. Through such a genuine exchange in which both speak and both are challenged, stretched, and changed, an understanding that remains in potency begins to become actualized. And that is, again, I think the third thing that we have to offer. As Dominicans, our prayer and our study of the Word of God take these three perspectives into account. The goodness and graced character of our world, the profound unity of the human person in all of his or her complexity, physical, emotional, social, intellectual, and spiritual, and third, the knowability of truth, one that is not statically possessed, but dynamically pursued through our encounter with the other. Our recognition of the importance of these three insights allow us to do more than speak, to do more than lecture, and to do more than write. They allow us truly to communicate and truly to proclaim the word of God in a way that others might be able to receive it, accept it, and to acknowledge it with joy. So I thank Richard for helping us to have this direction in terms of a Dominican to mystic understanding of communication. And I think we brothers are in a privileged position in the evangelical task of the order, proclamation of the gospel, to in fact use these elements of our tradition, and I'm sure there are others, I've spoke, only spoken of three, in our efforts to, um, to advance the proclamation of the good news in our time. Thank you very much.